Hello, everyone, and welcome to My Family and the Mob, an evening with Russell Shorto. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sierra Green, and I work as an archivist at the Heinz History Center. We here at the History Center are so honored to welcome Russell Shorto to Pittsburgh. This evening, we're going to be exploring local mob history, and in particular, delving into the ways in which Russell deploys his skills as a trained historian, master storyteller, and genealogist to delve into and surface this really murky history in a sensitive way. A couple of housekeeping remarks to begin, some of which will be relevant to all of you, others of which will be relevant just to our virtual attendees or to our or, um, in person attendees. So hang with us. We have live captioning provided by ACS Captions. Virtual attendees, you can access this by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. This will be available throughout the evening. After a brief introduction, we're going to transition to a moderated discussion with Russell about his book. Following this discussion, we'll take questions from the audience. Russell will then partake in a book signing session. Our museum shop is graciously on site here this evening to your right, selling copies of Russell's book. We welcome questions for Russell. For our virtual folks, please submit those questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Those of you that are with us in person, you have two ways to contribute questions. There's a slip of paper at your seat. You can either scan the QR code and contribute your question digitally, or you can use the old-fashioned method and write it down. And we have a box at a table um, over to your left where you can contribute those written questions. We do this so that we can equally balance the questions that are coming in from our virtual audience and our in-person crowd. Virtual attendees, if you need any technical help this evening, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And we ask that you use the chat and the Q&A to help maintain a supportive and positive environment. In-person attendees, there are restrooms to your left down the hallway. We also have emergency exits to your right and to your left. And then those of them that are with us virtually, I fully expect that you know where the restrooms and exits are in the proper of your own homes. <laughs> we do have assistive listening devices available for those of us who joined in person, and you can receive those at our registration table. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague and collaborator for this event, Melissa Marinaro, Director of the Italian American Program. Melissa. Buonasera. I'm Melissa, and I direct the Italian American program here at the History Center. And tonight, we welcome scholar and historian Russell Shorto, author of Small Time, a story of my family and the mob, to engage him in a conversation about his family. During our discussion, Russell will impart his knowledge as a writer and researcher, giving us guidance for our pursuits as genealogists, public historians, and keepers of local history. He will also discuss a topic which is difficult for many, having family involved in the mob. Over the years, I've received many inquiries about the history of the organized crime in Western Pennsylvania, with questions covering topics such as the black hand, bootlegging, numbers running, and wise eyes. And I've also received as many criticisms about said history, especially from the Italian American community, leading some to question the value of preserving and sharing these accounts. It has put the Italian American program in a precarious position. We are responsible for documenting history, good and bad, and we are not in a position of sanitizing the truth. That being said, I found it very difficult to collect on the subject matter which is one of the reasons why we were so keen to invite Russell to speak about this process. When researchers inquire about the mob, we have little in the way of primary sources to offer beyond a few photographs, historic newspaper articles, and some oral history excerpts. I have heard accounts off the record, but not many are willing to donate these stories to the museum. This is certainly due to stigma around stereotypes something that has festered over the years within different American communities. In order to combat stereotypes, we must confront those histories head on and not shy away from investigation. 
Tonight, Russell will echo what many scholars have said about organized crime. It is not exclusive to the Italian American community and is often a product of being a part of a marginalized group. It's my hope that you will find inspiration in Russell's commitment to uncovering history and for his ability to tackle a tough subject with sensitivity and veracity. Russell Shorto is the author, most recently of Small Time, and of six earlier books, including Amsterdam, A History of the World's Most Liberal City, and the national bestseller, The Island at the Center of the World. He is the executive director of the Dynasty <laughs> Vogel Institute at the New York Historical Society, a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine, and senior scholar at the New Netherland Institute in Albany, New York. From 2007 to 2013, he was director of the John Adams Institute in Amsterdam. And in 2009, he was awarded a knighthood from the Dutch government for his work in increasing historical understanding between the Netherlands and the United States. In 2018, he was inducted into the New York State Writers Hall of Fame and he was born and raised in Johnstown, PA. Please welcome Russell Shorto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Sierra. Um, and uh, thanks to the Heinz History Center for doing this. What an amazing facility. I've been in many historical societies. They usually don't look this grand. You can, you can tell by the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all very much for being here. So we're going to dig in first and talk a little bit about some of the historical aspects of the text. So for those in the audience who haven't had a chance to read the book, could you describe to us who some of the main figures are in the story and what their relationship is to you? Okay, um, I got into it. Uh, so first of all, I've always known that my grandfather and his brother-in-law ran the mob in Johnson, my hometown. Um, and my grandfather was Russ. He was originally Rosario, but he was Russell or Russ, and I was named after him because that's the, the sort of Sicilian tradition of naming the firstborn son after the father's father. Um, uh, so I always knew that, but I also knew that we don't talk about sort of thing because uh, and it wasn't you know like America it wasn't code of science or anything formal it was just you know people didn't talk about it but as a kid you 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 know whatever the topic is whatever the taboo thing is kids just know because they hear it in between conversations from adults or whatever um, so I knew that and I also internalized that well we don't talk about it so I didn't talk about it I didn't think about it and um even though then I came to write history for a living, I, it never really occurred to me to write about that. Um, and then the, the first character then, okay, if I can speak in terms of characters, um, who came, came to the picture is my mother's cousin, Frank, Frank Filia. Um, it's my father's father that I'm talking about. Um, Frank, uh, had, I barely knew him because he left town when I was young. Uh, but he, it turns out he had worked for my grandfather. He was a numbers runner and he worked in pool ball. And he was a jazz musician. And he eventually went to Las Vegas and had his whole career there. And uh, so then when he came back home, he didn't have that silence thing about it. To him, these were just great stories. Uh, so um, he was the one who, at a gathering, he said, hey, what are we going to do about the story? And I said, what story? And he said, what story? Your grandfather, the mom. And the other relatives around kind of you know, shrunk like that. You know, like, you know. um, but uh, so he kind of first of all got me thinking about Russ and Joe, little Joe, who was Russ's partner, who was really his boss. Little Joe reported, as we will talk, to Pittsburgh and then Pittsburgh reported to New York. Um, this is all old ancient history, so uh, you know, we don't have to worry about so at least I don't think I have to worry about so they are kind of the, the main figures in that sense. Really, in a way, the main figure in the book to me is my dad, uh, who was my grandfather's eldest son. Uh, and ultimately, the book then becomes about as much about 
my dad and me looking for his dad. What was his dad up to? Because my father knew maybe more than anyone a lot of while I was working on the book. What it was, but he knew it as a kid. Um, and uh, so that was a really interesting uh, process. And then there were lots of other people involved, my grandmother me, being the main one, who I knew much better than I knew my grandfather. My grandfather had been ostracized by the family uh, by the time I was really aware. Uh, he was really hard on people. He was uh, traumatizing for that whole, uh, for his family. Uh, and particularly my grandmother. Um, but I was the oldest in my family, and so my mom had her hands full, and she would often drop me off at my grandmother's house. My grandfather was out of the house. Uh, and so I would spend, you know, summers with her and things like that, and she would periodically talk to me, kind of go on rampages about my grandfather. And so I heard about it, you know, as like a five-year-old or something. Um, and, you know, Eventually, as an adult, I'm trying to process that, and that's, in a way, what this book was. And you're talking in the book about Johnstown during the 1950s and the 1960s. So can you paint for us a picture of some of the key characteristics of the town during that period? And, and I'm going to point out to the crowd that we have actually a picture of Johnstown on the screen. This is the cover of Russell's book. And this is a picture you found in the, was it the Boston Public Library? Is that where I found it? And, uh, and so this gives us a little idea of what the main drag looked like. Yeah, this like. is 1962, so a little bit after the central event in the town, which is when uh, a bookie was murdered. And that kind of spelled the beginning of the end of things for them. So over on the left, you see the Democrat Club. The building right beside that is where it was City Cigar, which was a cigar store, which was kind of their headquarters. And uh, above it, they had their office when all the bookies would report there. And it was like two doors this way is uh, it's still in City Hall in Johnstown. So it's called City Cigar, and it was and it was positioned there because then you know the, the cops and the mayor would stop in and they'd take their envelopes and you know, they'd shoot the breeze with the guys for a while. You know, it was all very uh, you know that's how you you created kind of an umbrella of of protection around, around your activity. And so, based on your research, would you say is this what the mob looked like in small town America? Based on my research, and I can add that based on uh, uh, hundreds of emails that I've gotten since the book came out from people who are not just from Western Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia, from Dubuque, Fresno, uh, Amarillo, you know, all over uh, Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska, people saying that's what it was like, you know, but it was my great uncle who, you know, and then they kind of draw the parallels between people. So, yeah, I think it was very much the model uh, that was followed. And it relates to what it was like in big cities. I mean, everybody has in their mind a picture of New York, Chicago, and all that. So it's related to that, but it's also quite different, I think, because of the size. And because of the size, uh, you know, in big cities, the, uh, the amounts of money, the amounts of power, and, and, and the anonymity meant that violence was uh, always a factor. In small towns, not so much. And uh, I think that's because what I was just talking about, that kind of system of payoffs, I mean, this was uh, mostly uh, the, the business in its heyday, mostly was gambling. And uh, it was providing a public service. A lot, so many people over a certain age who I interviewed uh, just said that, you know, they, you know, there was no television and it was an activity and everybody, Everybody had their bookie and everybody played the numbers. And uh, so um, that system of payoffs, you were, you were um, acknowledging that this is an illegal activity, but that it will get kind of sanctioned in a way. And, uh, and that was allowed to, the authorities would allow that, provided they got their envelope, um, because it was relatively benign, because there wasn't a lot of violence. And that's what, as I say, when this, Boogie got killed, that, that coincided, it was in 1960, that coincided with uh, JFK's campaign and coming into the White House, his brother Bobby Kennedy uh, became Attorney General and he had this, uh, 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 he had kind of campaigned on this, we have to do something about the mob. 
And so uh, this, the, so you have that situation beginning to change on the national level. And then here, this, uh, coincidentally, in this little town, there's this murder that's on the front page. And, and uh, that's why, as I say, it, it's spelled at the end of the end. And you're talking a little bit now about the scale of the operation in Johnstown and in other small towns. And I think people are going to be shocked at some of these estimates of the money <laughs> that, that was coming in. Can you talk to us a little bit about what those figures look like? Yeah, the other things I guess are all, you know, you talked about not being frustrated by not having primary source of material. Well, I didn't have it either. So, you know, what you what you do is you kind of try and you talk to everybody who knew something about it back then. And you look up sources, uh, what sources you can, and you try to come up with an estimate. But um, millions of dollars, $20 million in a 10-year in a period, I think, uh, they took in, which I think I calculated, I put it in the book, come, would come out to like 300 million today or something. Uh, a lot of money. And um, uh, then the next question that people ask me is, where did it go? And people in my family say, where did it go? Um, and, and, you know, they just, they, 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 they didn't, my, my grandfather and his brother-in-law clearly never took a course in money management. <laughs> um, they believed, they were, they were, they wanted to be big shots, you know, and, you by being how do you, were you a big shot? But you know you hear that this 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 guy's kid he's a mill worker this kid is smart I'll give money for him to go to college you know and that made them feel you know like look you know and and, all, and there was you know they were providing a um, you know again this is at the the period I'm talking about now is you're coming out of the period of extreme discrimination against Italians and uh, but that was still very much what they were shaped on you know we have to. Uh, we have to provide, we have to protect, we have to, and so they very much were like uh, people, you know, again, people who I talked to in town who were above a certain age, saw them as on their side, you know, they were, they were, um, they were helpful, you know, and that's what they did with their money, as well as, you know, do things for themselves, I mean, but you didn't show off, you know, they, they had kind of a no padlocks rule, they always wore suits off the rack, they didn't have the suits made, but as soon as they left town, they'd go to Florida or Atlantic City, and then, you know, everything would break loose. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that this was a network. Folks were interconnected in the region. So can you explain a little bit about how Johnstown has a connection to other small towns and, and Pittsburgh as yeah. part of this? Yeah. Um, so, well, maybe it's best to talk about in terms of uh, Russell and Joe mm -hmm. and how they uh, came, to, came to their positions. Um, my grandfather grew up as uh, the son of Sicilian immigrants. Uh, so he was, um, they had come from a little town in uh, Sicily called San Pierinecetto, in the hills above Messina. And um, they, uh, Arrived. They first went to Punxsutawney. First of all, um, if you don't mind me backing up, oh, right um, first my great grandfather um, emigrated, uh, as, as did millions of Italians at the time, to work in the coal mines. And he worked in the coal mines in Punxsutawney. And then, after a couple of years, he sent for uh, his girlfriend. Um, there was a story in my family. There was kind of a rumor that that my uh, great-grandparents had never married, and in fact, that he had a family in Sicily. I found out that that is true, um, and I found who his wife and children are, and in fact, a guy who's a researcher in the town told me that their offspring of the original family moved to Toronto, so I guess I've got, you know, family in Toronto. Um, so they, uh, so he comes to the, the Ponsantani, and then uh, after a couple of years, it's, you know, it is what he hoped, I guess. And uh, he sends not for his wife, but for this 18-year-old girl from the town. And her name was Anna Maria Previte. His name, his last name was Shorto, S-C-I-O-T-T-O. My last name is Shorto, S-H-O-R-T-O. So it was Americanized. Um, and those, the records in the town, in the village in Sicily, those families go back 
into the 1700s at least. Uh, so I just kind of imagine these two families, and they all knew each other. And he had this wife, and here's this girl, and how they met and what transpired there, I don't know. All I know is that um, uh, then he, um, uh, she shows up in the ship's manifest. Uh, you can learn, you know, if you're doing family history, you can learn so much from documents. But uh, I just said this the other day at a uh, talk on a completely different subject. That I mean, you you think you dream of like finding these gems in these historical documents, and you can find them, but <laughs> but they they're not going to glitter, you know. They, so you will you, the first time you'll just go right past them, you know. It's only as you develop context and and start to understand the situation more. So what jumped out at me, this is before I knew that he had a family there. What jumped out at me was uh, when Anna Maria came. Uh, they the, the, their standard um, columns, and the one column was, you know, who's going to vouch for you? Who are you going to stay with? And she listed him and the, his address in Punxsutawney. And then it's a relationship. She said cousin. Why is she saying that? You know. Um, so that then led me to sort of dig further and then uh, the reference to the village and uh, uh, his marriage and so on. Uh, they she arrives in Punxsutawney and they are in Punxsutawney, they are Antonino Shoto and Ana Maria Prevete. And then after a couple of years, I think maybe the strike in the steel mill in Johnstown, they were employing blacks and Italians then as as uh, you know, scabs to, to break the strike. And I think that may be why they came. And so like they get to Johnstown and uh, Antonino Shoto and Ana Maria Frevite are Tony and Mary Shoto. So they've somehow done the Americanization of that. Um, so uh, uh, they then begin having children, and, uh, and Russ, Russell uh, is their son, and he grows up in, in, in the town during Prohibition, and then he kind of earns his chops. And in fact, um, his father dies, and his mother then has a still in her house, and this was common all over the country, certainly in this part of Pennsylvania, uh, especially among uh, uh, single mothers. And I think it was typically there was a guy in the neighborhoods who set you up with this, because she didn't necessarily know how to do this, and who came around and collected and so on. And the kids, uh, Russ and his sisters, would go out, and they told me they would go out selling, you know, sort of Coke bottles stoppered with, with moonshine. Um, so he grows up in that. Meanwhile, uh, I haven't forgotten your question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the other uh, main player is Joe Regino. His family uh, emigrates from Naples to uh, Philadelphia, and then they move to a mining town near Johnstown. And uh, Joe grows up, and, and he uh, is a pretty tough guy. And then he moves back to Philadelphia, and he starts working for the nascent, you know, the, the mob in its early days. And he. Um, gets busted on a counterfeiting charge. They were running some sort of thing. And uh, the story, this is, I, I mean, I have the, the arrest record at the time he served, and then to match with that, because you are you know, you don't have all the primary source material you'd like to have, uh, the stories that I have are that he uh, refused to rat out this higher up who he was working with. And when he got out, uh, that coincided with the time when the mob in New York was kind of, they were very enamored of, uh, uh, of corporations, of American capitalism. And I think in, in, in a large sense, they were trying to duplicate what companies did. So they were beginning to open branch offices around. <laughs> Johnstown was then a booming town. Um, population was pushing 70,000, now it's maybe 20,000. Um, and uh, so, Joe was given Johnstown. He goes there and uh, has to figure out how to do this. And he very quickly meets and, and falls in love with this girl who works at this candy store on Central Park, uh, who happened to be Russell's sister. So they get married, and he's looking to start this operation. And here's Russ, who has grown up in this, uh, doing uh, first uh, prohibition and then running uh, his first arrests were for 
running uh, gambling out of the back of his car, um, the traps and car games and things. So he knows the town at that level. So it's kind of like that's how they fit together. So that's a very long-winded way of giving you a kind of uh, uh, personal sense of how this began. And, how, and as I say, people emailing me give me their stories of how their grandfather or whoever it was, uh, you know, came to form, came to be part of whatever the local operation. And you had mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of this begins out of conversations in your family. And so we're switching gears a little bit to talk about some of your methodology as, as a researcher. Um, so you're engaging in the field of oral history. Tell us a little bit about how doing those interviews, um, how does that add to your perspective and how do you then verify what they're telling you? Yeah, uh, good questions. Uh, this is the first time all the other books that I've written have been you know, set hundreds of years ago, so I wasn't able to interview people. Um, so this is the first time I've done that. It was really fascinating. And maybe I should pause and say, if you uh, have any interest in family history, uh, take out your recorder, you know, and find the oldest person in your family and just turn on the recorder. I said this to someone recently, and he said, I'm the oldest person in my family. I said, well, turn on the recorder and start telling stories. They're going to later, they'll appreciate it. Um, uh, so uh, it's it, anyway, that's a valuable thing to do, um, getting those stories down and the more uh, perspectives you get, especially on the same things, then that's when it becomes interesting. And your question of how you verify, well, if you get two or three stories and they're independent of each other, like they, they didn't know each other or something, and they're both saying more or less the same thing, you're starting to get a, a sense of, of, you know, this is probably like this. So what I did was uh, I, I did I know, a couple hundred hours of interviews with people in my family. And then what would happen was the, the normal uh, the way it worked was we lived in Cumberland, Maryland, about an hour from Johnstown. And part, mainly moved there partly from Amsterdam, uh, Europe, to work on this book. Um, so I'd go to town, go to my parents' house, sit there with my parents and turn on the recorder and we'd start, you know, I'd pick a topic or they would or whatever. And uh, we'd start talking and then they'd mention someone. I'd say, well, wait, who's that? I didn't, I'd never heard that name before. And my dad would, you know, pull, pull out his split phone and say, what are you need? Like, you know, say, are you home? We're coming over. <laughs> so then we'd go and we'd be sitting on this guy's porch and there would be another two hours, you know? And so you have to do, I mean, you have to you know when to stop too because you drive yourself crazy. But uh, but it's um, and and I was constantly uh, frustrated because you know what I heard over and over again was oh you didn't know him yet he just died you know so there's there's that too and I think we just kind of my wife and I just kind of something like ten of the people in the book who were you know I interviewed all that are gone you know just so do it now in a way. Um, so, uh, so uh, the, the oral history component, recording it, cross-referencing, and then other sources. I mean, of course, uh, I knew that these guys, the boys, didn't keep notebooks that are like on file in the library. <laughs> um, but uh, my, my dad at the time knew uh, the guy who was the chief of police in Johnstown. He gave me my own key to their records room, which is like a big walk-in closet with all these, you know, cardboard boxes. And I spent a weekend there just going through everything that you know I could and making copies of everything that would that was at all relevant. Period. Um, the Johnstown Tribune Democrat, Chip Minemeyer, was the editor, and he just said, "Here's the archive." You know, uh, that was useful. Um, the county courthouse in Evansburg. Uh, my dad and I did this <laughs> very memorable father-son trip where um, we went to the county courthouse and said to the clerk, you know, we're here for the records of uh, Russell Shorto. And, you know, I, I think we ordered them in advance. And then we went there and said what we were there for. And she pushed over the stack of his arrest records, you know. And, and I remember my father saying, well, I'll be a son of a bitch. <laughs> and I knew exactly what he meant because to him, to my dad, uh, you know, his whole life, you know, with anyone, any, if you grow up in anything, it's normal, you know, 
And he grew up in this world of, you know, the governor coming over for dinner, you know, things like that. And he knew it was not normal, but um, it was just his life. So he had that whole uh, experience of that. And now in his, he must have been close to 80 at the time, here is like official corroboration in a way. Oh, this is what it was. You know, this is what the, uh, uh, the records of our society, how it reduces that life to this, you know. So that, you know, that's what I did to try to, uh, as well as, of course, history books. I was talking to professors and people who know the small town mob and so on. So that's how I tried to stitch it together. Um, I actually agree with that. The pull on the thread of one of those source materials that you call out, and that's the historic newspapers. I'm wondering if you could share, Russell, what were some of your favorite stories drawn from your digging into the newspaper archives out of Johnstown? Yeah, there were um, two mainly, um, and uh, John, uh, the Johnstown Area Heritage Association is a great resource if you're doing research in Johnstown, um, and they have the, the records of both the Johnstown the Tribune Democrat, which used to be the Tribune and the Democrat, um, and then the Johnstown Observer, and the Tribune <laughs> Democrat has been the standard paper record for the town, and uh, it used to, I mean, now it's kind of very thin because it's a small town and there's not a lot of money. But then it was just amazing paging through it. It's like, you know, so full of ads and people are just buying. You can just feel the people in the 1950s buying and consuming and, you know. Um, and um, the Observer was a weekly. And a lot of towns around the country had weekly newspapers that were kind of like gossip columns. I mean, they, they would have two or three gossip columns. And then they would have a section right down the middle of the front page, and they would carry into the back, where it would be little sections separated by the little asterisk, you know, and it would be maybe a paragraph saying, we hear that uh, a local so-and-so has been seen, you know, and then they'll give you this little thing, and everybody knows who they're talking about, but they don't get the name, you know? So uh, that was really invaluable, because they would pick up on something, like with the murder of the book, Capita Palco was his name. Um, with his murder, uh, he went missing, and uh, his body didn't turn up. Uh, I'm not forgetting. It's about six weeks later, his body turned up. Um, so he went missing, and almost immediately, like so, in the in the in the Tribune Democrat, there's no, it's not mentioned at all for a long time. Uh, but almost immediately, uh, the Observer said, "You know, we where's Pippi? You know, Pippi the Falco, local, uh, you know." Gambling aficionado, uh, last seen, blah, 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 blah. What happened to him? And then they, then the next thing they're saying, his car was parked at Main and Pine Streets. And, you know, so they're giving you these little things. And then a couple of weeks later, the Tribune Democrat picks up the story. And, you know, and then it, once the body is found, of course, then it's the headline and you know, a picture of him. And, uh, so, you know, following, so again, if you're doing local history, that kind of source that existed all over the country um, is great because they were doing the legwork for you, and, they, and it's in print. Wonderful. And a distinction I want to draw here that I was so impressed with when I heard as an archivist is you, you hear the way Russell's talking about doing newspaper research. He's not sitting at a computer keyword searching in a digitized historic newspaper database. He's actually at job off flipping through issues and really getting a feel for the town as it was being reported on. In the same way that people who were living there at the time would have consumed that news. And that's what you start doing. You start being someone who's just reading the newspaper. And then, you know, when you're reading an actual newspaper, as opposed to just looking up at something that's in front of you on your screen, like here's the story I called up. If you're reading the newspaper, you're seeing the ad, you're seeing this other story, you're seeing a picture about some, you know, and it's all kind of coming together. And if you just keep doing that. So what I did, I mean, I did a lot of it there on site. But I also, I have, there's a great app for your phone called Tiny Scan, which just allows you to take a scan, even of like a big full size newspaper sheet. Uh, it's, it, it makes it a PDF immediately, and then it's search at home. I can sit and, and do that. But um, but yeah, we're just reading the newspaper uh, because I mean, it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing, I mean, if you only care about one thing, you know, your your ancestor or something, that, that's fine. But what I try to do is for myself and for the reader, recreate that world, that time, that, that, um, that um, you know, what people were feeling, what was on their minds. And 
and how uh, local issues and national issues are kind of colliding with one another uh, and yeah, paging through actual newspapers. Wonderful. So in the second in the command mob boss, your grandfather was probably better known than your average Johnstown resident with mob connections. So for those in the audience who suspect that they have family or ancestors with lower level mob connections, which of your research strategies would you recommend that they still pursue? Which of which one? Which of your research strategies would you would you recommend these folks still pursue if they have they suspect kind of ancestors with lower level mob connections? Well, I guess all of the above. I mean, first just contacting everybody, you know, talking to everybody and, and, and talking to everybody in your family. And that I have I found, I think initially I expected resistance for the obvious reasons. For the most part, I was surprised that I I didn't get it. And um, I I think it was been because enough time had gone by. Um, if I'd been doing this 20 or 30 years earlier, maybe people would have felt uncomfortable. Um, but a lot of people, I think, felt, um, you know, that this is history, and, and if they're gone, those stories are going to be gone. Um, so that was gratifying. So they then would tell me stories, and then they'd tell me about other people who might, and then we'd really have some, and it's useful, so it's useful to do one-on-one -on -one interviews. It's also to get two or three or four people together, because then they're going to trigger each other. Um, so one-on-one -on -one with person A, but then have person A involved with others too. Um, because then person A is going to kind of become a different person, you know, because they're uh, they're interacting with people. Um, so uh, that that I think for me that was kind of the baseline. And um, this started so after just going back to where I started with Frank Filio, my mother's cousin, prodding me to do this, uh, then he invited me, he said, whenever you think you want to do this, come and uh, we'll, we'll sit down. Uh, and I was dubious because, as I said, there were no primary sources, so what do we do here? So finally, living in Europe, I, um, I decided, all right, I'm going to go home for a week and see just if there's anything there. I can, uh, uh, and I called him and he said, okay, meet me at Panera, that's his hang time. Um, so we went to Panera Bread and I thought oh, he's going to tell me some stories from back in the old day and I turned on my recorder. And a uh, little old Italian guy came up and then another and another. He put out the word. And there were eight guys around us, like leaning on their cane. <laughs> uh, four hours later, really, I, I did stop. And I said, okay, this is something. You know, it's still, to me, it's still just hearsay because I haven't corroborated anything. And I, you know, but it was so much. That um, and, and so that's I think step one at least uh, you know if that's available and it doesn't have to be just in your family obviously it's just you know uh, networks are networks and people all have their window on the things and then whenever I when the book finally came out um, so many people um, including people in my family said things like that they were interested in the, in this because. Precisely because it was such a, uh, a story that nobody, you know, we, we don't really talk about it. Everybody had their little thing, you know, I remember this, and I remember, you know, they had their window on to it. Uh, but nobody had tried to pull it together into one picture, and that's what I tried to do. So, and now, now, having said that, you know, that about family members being open, not everybody. <laughs> there are some people in my family who did not want me to go there, and they're still not happy. And you know, I struggled with that a lot because you know you you, you want people to like you. Um, <laughs> but I finally, and I talked to friends who were writers who wrote memoirs, and they all said, you know, you're gonna you're gonna lose some people. And uh, I just decided that you know they have a right to feel that way. But this is my story, and I have a right to tell it. And um, I worked really a lot uh, with my dad on it, and he wanted that, you know. So uh, he died near the end of it, but uh, but uh, he wanted that, and I knew that, so I kept reminding myself. So we talked about kind of the history. We talked about some of your research research methodology. Now we're going to spend some time just learning from you about how you leverage your story's abilities um, for this book. So that's something awesome. And one of the things that Sierra and I are so impressed by were all of the creative ways that you brought life to the text. 
And one thing that we wanted to point out, because we liked the um, way that you used your grandfather's wallet and going through that wallet. And as museum professionals, we are very used to working with material culture. And um, we wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about how you also were looking beyond some of these primary sources and looking at the objects um, and how you wove that into your writing, because I think that's a really interesting technique for people to think about. As you said, you are you have to build a world um, and give people a sense of what was going on in that period. Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is, you know, you, you try to figure out how to, what questions to ask people to elicit things. And they're trying to help, you know, but it's, you know, it was only, uh, I, I, I don't know how many times I uh, sat down with my aunt, my grandmother's daughter, and she talked about things and tried to come up with people's names. And then uh, and at a certain point, I don't know what I asked, but she said, well, you know, because my grandmother died at the racetrack of a heart attack, you know, so it was a, it was a lifelong gambler and it was like the perfect way to go. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she said, well, you know, the, the hospital saved everything he had on this person, and I have it. Do you want that? Said, of course, I want that. <laughs> but I didn't know to ask that, you know. Um, and it didn't even occur to her. Uh, so, yeah, his wallet, he had a pocket full of race tickets. So I could see what kinds of things, what, what kind of races he bet on. Um, I'll get all those little snapshots, in the, you know, and, they, and he had lots of names of people. He'd have like a, a name and then a, a couple of things that, uh, uh, sprawled after. You know, he was still doing. Bets and things like that with people. It was long after he was out of the uh, out of the game, um, but he was still dabbling. Um, so that was a rich source. Uh, but how do you use it? Um, I slowly um, came around to uh, doing something, doing doing an approach in the book that uh, was a mix of history and memoir. Uh, I started it because I what I've done in the past is history. Uh, I started, I kind of convinced myself that this is okay, uh, you know, this is professional, uh, <laughs> by looking at it as history. I'm going to look at the history of the mafia, and I would uh, and, and use, of course, I was going to use my family and how they immigrated and, and, and so on. But um, I only slowly and through material like this that I said, well, if I am telling you, the reader, here I am with this wallet, and here I am with these things. And maybe talking to my aunt, and when she says, oh, let me get it, you know, then um, I'm the reader's involved in the process with me. We're finding this, this stuff out together. That's great. And we know that through this book, you're talking about difficult historical truths. So can you tell us a little bit about how in your writing, you approached some of the more sensitive and, and, and difficult aspects of this narrative. You mean having to do with the, the mob or? I would say having to do with the mob, there also was discovering, you know, your grandfather had a relationship with other women, and so there were half siblings that yeah, you yeah. learned about. Well, for me, that was great stuff because it's interesting. <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, I mean, it was really tricky because like, these people are alive, and I have to talk with them, and, you know. And so each of those was like, a, you know, what do I do here? How do I do it? And I would, again, I would try to involve them and say, look, I want to tell this story. And, and uh, uh, there, there are, there were a lot of situations where, um, for the most part, people wanted to tell stories. Um, and I think there were a couple situations, I know there were a couple situations where after, once they saw the print, then they were kind of annoyed. Uh, you know, I did, but I, I, I was straight up the whole time, I was saying, this is what I'm doing, of course I'm writing a book, and you know, this is nonfiction, and I think this is, uh, you know, people's, um, as someone once said, uh, people are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. And uh, so by, by telling their stories over a period of time, you're, you're doing history. This is American history. It's the story of, you know, I, I, I didn't delude myself into thinking that my story, my family's story is so special, everybody's going to want to read it. It's because it was taking place all around the country. Uh, but I think it's, it's universal. I also have this little 
uh, notion that the smaller a story is, the bigger it is. Uh, so if I'm focused on these two people, Russ and Mary, my grandparents, and their uh, their relationship, which was this, you know, flaming love affair, and then it got ugly and all mob and money and other women, and you know, <laughs> that's universal. You know, that's everybody can relate to that kind of story. And so you start with the story, and then you did the genealogy. We have folks in the audience who we know are genealogists who are going to do the reverse. Mm -hmm. They're starting with the genealogy, and now they're beginning to write the narrative. So what tips do you have for genealogists who are looking to, as you are saying, you know, take their family story, but connect it to something larger for others to engage in? Uh, well, first of all, it became such a... Uh, uh, a proponent of the idea of researching your own family, your own story, that I created an online course, tellyourfamilystory.com, so you can go there. And it will it's sort of 10 online guide yourself through uh, lessons uh, of what, you know, how to do it. But in terms of, um, I, I think in a way, that's a, uh, you know, if you're starting with having done all this genealogy, that's great. You've got your skeleton. Uh, one question to ask yourself is, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to write a book like this? It's a narrative that's for a broad audience. Uh, do you want to write something that is for your children, uh, which is fine? Uh, do you want to do you want to write a screenplay for a movie? Um, you know, there's a lot of different directions you can go here. Uh, you can so to begin to answer that. Who am I, and what are the materials? So, what kind of person am I? Am I a visual person? Am I uh, you know, uh, 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 am I a literary person? Do I have ambitions in this regard? Uh, and what's the material? Uh, I taught a course while I was working on it at uh, City University of New York. Uh, I taught a, a writing seminar in, in uh, family history. And um, my students um, all had projects uh, along these lines. And um, they would come up with these uh, amazing stories. And then there's a question of, right, how do you, you know, each, in each case, it's a different puzzle. How do you stitch it together? And what kind of story do you want to tell with it? What do you think is appropriate? And one person's story was about their relative, the great, great aunt or whoever, who uh, was in the women's suffrage movement and who was an amateur photographer. Well, you, you could do a photo essay, you could be a book, you know. Uh, because it's a visual, there you have the photographs, and it's connected to uh, this momentous history. Uh, so that may tell you, that may give you, you know, the material you're working with may, may give you one uh, hint. And, you know, one of the things I'd love to return to is just the personal, again, family history element of this book. Um, and we, you mentioned it earlier. Earlier, just one of the more dramatic revelations of both the discovery of your grandfather and really great grandfather confirming that he had two families in, in Sicily and then here in the United States. And um, you, you know, you are very open with um, kind of the reflections that were prompted in yourself as a result of this discovery. So I'd like you to do just a quick reading from your book of, of some of that, um, some of that reflection to start, and then we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit. Sure. Um... This seems to me so much a part of the work in doing family history, or for that matter, any narrative digging into the past, trying to suss out what was going on in the head in heads that are long dead. Maybe this is one's own ulterior motive. Consciousness, even one's own, is such a tenuous and unfathomable thing. Maybe we try to look into our predecessors to shore it up in ourselves. Some of them, I'm trying to there. Uh, um, grapple with why do you why do I want to do this? Why are we doing it? Because I'm trying to understand ultimately you do family history to understand yourself better, I think. I can try to game out different scenarios, but at the bottom, one has to resort to the truism that human beings are complex creatures, buffeted by circumstances, sometimes of their own devising, whose motivations can shift on a dime, then later shift again and then again. So that's, you know, I was trying to figure out things like, you know, why my grandfather would behave the way he did. He, he had everything. He had all this, uh, um, locally, he had fame, he had success, he had power. He would uh, uh, go into a, a diner 
at lunchtime and uh, have lunch with someone and leave, and then everybody would find out that he bought everybody lunch, you know. And you know, he, again, he was being a big shot, but everybody in town knew him, and he loved that, you know. But then he, he I mean, we talked about it the way he did it, but he kind of blew it all. He um, became a drunk, and you know, really a knockdown drunk, um, and just trying to understand the way people, you know, what motivates them and, and the way they operate. And, you know, of course, you turn those questions on yourself, too. No, I think that's something that, again, a lot of genealogists and researchers can really relate to, without a doubt. Um, so I have one final question for you before we transition into the Q&A. Um, just getting back to this idea more broadly of doing um, history, this kind of history on a local mob. Um, do you have like particular books or articles that you'd recommend to our crowd? Again, the genealogists and the crowd of researchers who are really interested in delving into and exploring this history further. Yeah, the book, of course, which we all recommend. Yeah, um, I'm, there's so many. Um, I did a, uh, an event with uh, Jenny Egan, Jennifer Egan, um, who's a novelist, and um, her novel Manhattan Beach about New York, and she and I kind of compared notes in how we worked and. Uh, um, I mean, in her case, she she turned it into fiction. But it's such a, a book like that is so rich, and I learned so much from from doing it. And then, and she has, even though it's fiction, she has a, a, a section at the end where she goes into her sources and her materials and, and how she decided to, and then where she diverged from. You know, so uh, a lot of inspiration you can get from fiction, and then you decide, and and then you know. So many great memoirs. Angela's Ashes is one of the great uh, memoirs of, um, uh, 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 you know, dirt poor Irish suffering and, and coming to America. Um, memoir for it is a tricky thing for me as a writer of history because you know I'm used to like footnoting them, and so that's why I felt compelled wherever I was not clear about what actually happened. I wanted to kind of signal to the reader, this is what this guy says, or, you know, to the best of my knowledge, this is how it went. But I don't know, you know, it's frustrating. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. So at this point, we're going to transition to um, the questions from everyone in the audience. But before we do that, I'd like to take a moment and highlight a digital handout that you all will be receiving via email after the event. So this handout has tips on how to research local mob history using our collections here at the Heinz History Center. We really encourage folks to learn from Russell's incredible work on this book and to turn to the limited sources that are available to surface this history. There are some real standout sources that we call attention to in this handout, including our rich local newspaper collection, as well as the papers of Ray Spriegel, who was an in infamous investigative reporter from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette from the 19-teens to the 1950s. And he reported on racketeering and the mob throughout that period. And here's just one example of an anonymous tip letter that Spragel received from a reader who was informing on collusion and bribery in the local numbers racket in his town in Brownsville, Pennsylvania. So we really hope in many ways that this evening will spark deeper dives into this history. Now for questions, though, from all of you in the audience. Virtual attendees, please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you haven't already. And again, for our in-person crowd, please either use the QR code on the sheet in front of you or write down your questions and submit them to the box to the table to your left. Well, this is going to kick things off. Okay, so our first question. Did you suspect your father or grandfather might get implicated in the murder of Pippi during your research? And did this make you hesitant to dig deeper into the story? I did suspect that that might be the case, and my grandfather certainly was one of the people who were uh, was uh, you know uh, suspected. Um, as what as were a lot of people that I wrote about, including Frank Filia, who was helpful. he was uh, rather dramatically rounded up. Uh, and um, no, I don't. I mean, I wanted to know if it was knowable. Um, and I, it wasn't for me, I wasn't able to cover who killed me. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to know. And then you, but I think what's beneath the question is if your ancestor did something really bad, 
what are you, how do you deal with that? What do you, what do you, how does that make you feel or whatever? Um, and I don't think, I mean, if it, if it was my father we were talking about, that would be different because, you know, I would have been devastated. But uh, talking about my grandfather or someone further back, I don't have that connection. I mean, maybe somebody else is different, but I don't have that connection to those people. Um, and I know a lot of people, genealogists, one sort or another, who read books of mine and then write me in, you know, very proudly about their ancestors. They kind of only want to know one side of it. And that's fine. And so, but I find it curious that they only want to know one side because everybody has many sides and don't want to get around the picture. We had some people. We had someone ask, um, you were certainly, first, a great compliment, which I agree with. You've achieved a beautiful nonfiction narrative with a perfect marriage between personal story and research. How do you know when you've hit that sweet spot? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know. You just, by feel, you know, you keep working the angles. And uh, this was a very different book for me from writing history. And yet, in writing history, um, I... I, I always kind of start from an intellectual place, you know, like I have an idea. This has never been explored before, and I will, you know. But ultimately, I get to an emotional sense. I have to emotionally connect with these people of the past and what they were engaged in. Even if I don't like them, you know, you still have to, you know, have that. So that has to, I have to feel that throughout. I have to feel that connection. And if I'm not feeling it, which often I'm not, then I know, okay, there's, there's something wrong. I'm, I'm being uh, too easy on myself, or I'm not digging hard enough in something. Um, and, and and then, of course, you give it to readers. I, I have a kind of core group of readers, my wife, my editor, my agent, uh, various friends, and then readers who are more in that field, you know. And you're getting your kind of, and if it's the same people, if some of them are the same people book to book, then I know what kind of, you know, I know this one's going to be harder on me, this one's going to be harder on, are you sure about that? And, you know, so uh, that, that helps. It's not one any one thing. Here's a question. When I was a child, the older Italians would tell us that it was the Sicilians that were in the mob, <laughs> not other Italians. <laughs> Is there any truth to this? <laughs> No, but, but there were, I mean, of course there were, I, I'm not, I'm not an authority on the law. I mean, I did a few years of research, but I'm not really an authority. And um, uh, there were, we were talking before, there were different mobs. You are more of an authority than I am. Uh, there are different mobs, there are different Italian mobs, there were Italian mobs, Jewish mobs. Um, uh, later, you get all different nationalities. Um, the, the the Sicilians were supposedly the kind of central or 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 maybe the, the most intense or most vicious. I don't know if that's true. Uh, in, in the case of my family, my grandfather is Sicilian, but little Joe, his partner, was uh, from Naples. So you know. You talk in the book about um, the history of numbers running as connected to the African American community. And someone has a question about um, any relationships that you might have discovered in your research between the African American community and Johnstown, and then what you came to learn about your um, your family's connection to the mob as it operated at the time. Uh, about the, what I learned about the African American community in Johnstown? So, um, if, if there were any relationships between the African American community and Johnstown, and then the mob as you knew it to be, um, it, as it operated in I think town. that they were, uh, you know, and, and this is from, you know, the stories from the other, from the record and from the way the old guys talk. I think they really kind of segregated themselves. Uh, and this is, you know, going back to living memory. So it was like going back to the 50s, say. Um, um, they, and there's uh, somebody told me the story of this one guy uh, who was part of things and hung out of the pool hall who had a, had a driver, but his driver couldn't come into the pool hall because he was black. So, you know, there was, um, I think there was a black, um, if you want to say mafia, and it was Italian mafia, and they surely interacted, but they kept things separate, including neighborhoods, I think, largely. 
Okay, I'm going to assume that you have to be from Johnstown to know this one. Coney Dog or Sundowner? <laughs> okay. Um, this is a great question about digging into and describing a little bit more of the role of women in the mob. So, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I wish, you know, as I said, my grandmother, I knew her much better. And I really wish that she had been around longer or that I had gotten more from her at the time because she, you know, her perspective on things. Uh, would have been invaluable. Um, she um, she put up with so much crap, and I asked um, this woman who was let me think, my dad's cousin, who was like their accountant. She did the accounting for them. She did books with her for the local month. Um, uh, I said, you know, we we're talking about my Mary, my grandmother. And I said, why did she put up? But she said, back then, you didn't. I said, why didn't she just leave it? She said, back then, you didn't do that. It just wasn't an option, you know. Uh, so, uh, but in, in their relationship, as I said before, they had this really uh, strong, early uh, uh, love affair. And then they had a period of time where I think things were really good, where he was on the rise. And I think she was proud of him. I mean, you know, a furry. Uh, and I think he was proud of her. Uh, he, she was uh, unusual for Johnstown. She had left uh, as a teenager to go to New York City, worked as a waitress, sent her family was very poor, sent money back, and eventually came back. And she knew how to you know, wear furs and things like that. So he uh, was very impressed by her. Um, and But women had nothing to do with the business. Now, except in the case of Minnie, who I was referring to, who was a pattern and she did the books. And all she knew was, you know, she did the paperwork and added it up, and that's what she told. Um, but uh, they really kept it separate. And uh, at the same time, I think uh, and people told me this too. It was exactly the same for, you know, the, the people who worked at the uh, were managers of the department store or law offices or whatever. You know, the man came home and the wife didn't, he didn't start talking about his problems at work with his wife. You know, that was a, it was just a different relationship between men and women at the time. We have a couple people who have asked about the Shangri La Supper Club. Mm -hmm. uh, since I haven't been able to find any photos of this on the internet. Have you come across and or any other information about this Shangri La? I have a lot of information, but I haven't. I've never seen a photo of it. I'm sure there are photos. Um, and somebody told me, you know, there, a lot of things came to me after people read the book, and people said that there was, uh, you know, little Joe when his daughter got married. Um, it was in I want to say 1970 or 71, something like that. They got married at Shangri La Supper Club. And this somebody emailed me and said they know that there's a, a home movie, a you know, home movie of this. I haven't seen it, but um, then my dad, a couple of years later, this was in a hot moment. You know, he was at the uh, this grand wedding at Shangri La, and a couple of years later, the Godfather came out with the wedding scene, and my dad went, oh. <laughs> it was like so similar. <laughs> Well, if you don't mind, I just want to jump in because we have another follow-up that mentions the Godfather asking, what did your family members think of it when it came out? Uh, I don't know if I asked anybody what they thought of it when it came out, but um, it, I think that's just a natural touchstone. I think a lot of people, uh, Mike Galino, who was a main source of information uh, uh, in the book, he was this larger-than-life guy who died in the course of uh, my work on it. Um, he uh, he, 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 I, I'm, I'm not remembering his quote, but he basically said, Mario Puzo got everything wrong except for two things. So I forgot what the two things were. <laughs> but, you know, people have their very strong takes on it, you know, and what was wrong about it. Um, we had a question about, you know, I think those of us that are genealogists know that, um, that the story really, like, never ends as long as you continue to do research. So were there any insights that, um, that were gleaned after you published the book that you wish, man, I wish I would have been able to put that in there? Yeah, and there are a lot of little, I mean, nothing absolutely revelatory or earth-shaking, but so many people have emailed me with bits of things. You know, this one woman said, uh, emailed me and said, you know, my father was uh, an editor of the Tribune Democrat, and he was assigned to the Falco case, and 
I kept these boxes of his things for years and years, and then finally a few years ago, I threw it out. <laughs> and then I thought, well, maybe just as well, because the book is up. <laughs> So, someone asks, how did you come to leave Johnstown, become a historian, and focus on Dutch early colonial history? <laughs> um, well, I left and I, I went to George Washington University in DC, and from there I just wanted to travel to Tokyo, around Europe, and um, uh, started to write. And, you know, when people ask me about getting into being a writer, I say, it's so different now, and I don't really know what to say, but I started writing different kinds. I started traveling and writing travel pieces. Um, and then eventually I wrote a piece for GQ magazine that I turned into my first book. And then I started um, doing narrative history. And I realized over time, you only, you know, a lot of things about yourself, you only know when you get a certain age, uh, that I tend to naturally want to try to get to the origins of things. So my first book was called Gospel Truth. It was about uh, the, the biblical scholars searching for the historical Jesus. So not necessarily the Jesus of faith, but what can we know from the historical record? Uh, and that was me as having been raised Catholic, um, trying to come to terms with it, trying to get you know back to the origins. Um, and when I was living in New York, um, I eventually wanted to know the Norse Dutch roots because that was the origin. I mean, at, at the time, I didn't think of it that way, but that's what I was doing. So that's how I got into the whole Dutch thing through Dutch, through being a New Yorker and wanting to get a New York's beginnings. And of course, this family is, I mean, this book is my own uh, origin story. Um, one of the things that we haven't touched on that is clear in your book is this idea that the illegal gambling that your grandfather was involved in is, of course, not legal, legal in the state lottery. So do you have any thoughts on the legalization of gambling and its effect on the public and the law? On the law? Um, I, don't, I don't really care about that. Uh, I mean, I don't care about that whole thing. But um, uh, yeah, I don't, I, it's mostly what interests me is that gambling was such a phenomenon in the middle of the century at the time when these ethnic groups, not just Italians, were really discriminated against. And so it became, they saw it as an opportunity. Our first prohibition is okay, everybody still wants to drink. Now that they put out the legal places out of business, we'll just provide it. And then everybody, people were crazy for gambling. And yet it was terribly frowned on. It was a very immoral thing. So they provided that service partly because, you know, with my grandfather, he was a really smart guy, um, he didn't have the opportunity to become a lawyer, to go to college, anything like that. So this is what was. Uh, available to him. So I look at gambling in those terms um, and uh, uh, that how it affected, you know, Italian Americans um, and how it became part of the, it became an opportunity for that. How do you feel about we do one more and then we will turn it over for the book signing and for those folks who would like to have a moment with Russell. Um, but I think this is a good question for us to end it on. Now that the project is complete and your wonderful book is published, what have you done or will you do to preserve your research and raw materials, meaning your interviews, newspaper clippings, notes, photographs? So very much thinking like an archivist. Who asked this question? Who asked this question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have thought about it a little bit, but I haven't decided to do anything in particular. I mean, maybe uh, in Johnstown is the right place. Or if you want to talk about it, but yeah, I mean, I have lots and lots of material. And you know, the other thing is that only occurred to me um, later is all these hours of uh, interviews that I've done with people. I mean, what do I do? I didn't ask their permission to to uh, preserve it, you know, in in any way. It just they were giving me permission to do it for the purpose of my book. So I don't know what I can ask you maybe later about that. How does what does one do? So just uh, in sum, if you're interested in doing family history, do it now. Go turn on your recorder and 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 find your relatives. And that's a fantastic uh, statement is do it now. Yeah. Well, we can't thank you so much. This has just been such a rich and wonderful discussion. Um,
Thank you all again so, so much.